the What to Next podcast helps you build a TBR of future favorite books. In each episode, Lori and Maine interviews authors and book influencers to recommend books they loved for you to pick up today. If you're an avid reader, always looking for your next free read, then the show. Hi, Rebecca. Welcome to What to Next podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So happy to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am an author. Um, I have previously written four young adult novels, um, but my adult fantasy debut, River Enchanted, will be coming out on the 15th, which is very exciting. But um, if you had asked me when I was a kid years ago, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would have said author. Like I knew from a very early age that I wanted to write and publish books. And I think it just stemmed from my love of reading. Like I was a voracious reader. So um, I just feel so honored that I have the opportunity to write full time. It's, um, it's been wonderful. Also, you know, it's hard too, but it's, it's something that I love doing storytelling. But um, a few fun facts though, is I have an Australian shepherd named Sierra. Mm -hmm. She once was like addicted to Frisbee. Um, She (laughs) actually was so good at catching it. Not like the hard Frisbee, but the soft Frisbee. Yeah. Um, She is now 11 years old. So we had to retire Frisbee a few years ago because she kept injuring her legs, but um, she is like my little companion and she's, she's good to have around because she makes sure I get up from my laptop and go outside and go for a walk. Um, but I also love gardening, reading, obviously. Um, I love the mountains and personality wise, I am an Enneagram four and an INFJ. So I don't know if you know your Enneagram yeah. number or not. You I do? Am, yeah, I'm a seven and I am an INFP. So okay. um, we're, we're similar, but we're a different of adjustment and perception, I think it is, so the PMJ, yeah. so. Oh, good. I'm glad you know your Enneagram, because sometimes, like, I, like, give this little fact, and people are like, what, what is that? Like, what is Enneagram? <laughs> so it's always nice to meet a fellow Enneagram person. I love it. I love it. It's so popular in Instagram. Like, I did not know what Enneagram was until I started seeing people's feed about it, and I was like, I, I just go the, down the rabbit hole, I'm like, where does this pretty graphics all about about personality? And then there's like all these Enneagram accounts that tell you like what your personality looks like in pretty graphics, you know? Yeah, I love those too. I can definitely go down the rabbit hole too, like looking at those graphics. But. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I got so many questions to tell you, to ask you. But first of all, like, so did you always wanted to write fantasy or do you have tendency to something else? And like, what was the transition like from YA to adult fantasy? So I have always been a fantasy writer. Um, I grew up like reading the Chronicles of Narnia, Tolkien. So I was like very epic, (laughs) epic world, you know, um, fantasy world. So, um, but the transition from YA to adult, it it kind of was just like a very seamless thing, almost Mm -hmm. like it was meant to happen. And it's funny because when I was writing A River Enchanted, I did not set off to write an adult novel. It just kind of happened very Mm -hmm. organically. And so when I was, when I'd finished drafting it, I was looking at it and I felt like some pieces were YA because that's what I know and I'm familiar with, right? So Mm -hmm. it's like, I'm drawing on that familiar um, pieces of my writing, but then I could also see that there were parts of the book that were very much adult and were different themes that I hadn't touched on yet. So um, I just felt like the best thing to do was to revise it with it uh, being more of an adult novel in mind and try to Mm -hmm. elevate the YA pieces. But it was kind of scary because I was like, you know, I've never been on submission on the adult side of the market. So this is like a big jump for me. Like it might not yeah. sell, you know, like, yeah, so it was, it was a risk, but um, thankfully it found an editor who loved it. But for the most part, like, you know, all the editorial process and everything has just been very similar to YA. Um, but it had, I do feel like it has opened up my world a little bit more mm-hmm. because even though a lot of adults do read YA, um, mm-hmm. there are some that don't, you know, so um, hopefully just continue to just kind of broaden my horizon and, and reach new readers with this book as well. Yeah. And I think sometimes readers, I noticed there's a transition between young YA to going out to adult. And there's like all these readers from the 2012s, the Gen Z, the Gen X, you know, the millennials, sorry, the millennials, I'm older millennials. So, but it's the millennials are that grew up reading them. They're like growing up to not reading like adult themes, you know, uh, books. Mm-hmm just to so there's like an audience there who's like there is yeah and they're like oh there's actually something that's meant for me to read now you know that's not just YA so yeah exactly 
I love this. I love this market. It's, it's growing. The fantasy fantasy market is growing. So talking about everyone chant to tell us the elevator pitch. What is it all about? Why should we buy it? So let me, I'll tell you like the, the one sentence, which is so hard to boil it down to one sentence, but it is a grumpy bard must team up with his childhood enemy rival uh, to discover why young girls are going missing on their island. And to expand on that a little bit, our protagonist is a, a bard named Jack who was born on this very magical island, but was sent away um, when he was young to study music on the mainland. So in those 10 years, he's been away from home. He has really distanced himself from his clan. Um, he's estranged from his mom. And he's just decided that he will never go back home and he'll just stay on the mainland studying music, teaching music. Um, but one day this letter arrives and it's summoning him home instantly. And it's been signed by his laird. And the letter says, bring your heart immediately upon receipt and you must, you know, come home. So of course he can't disobey his Laird's order. So Jack decides, well, I'm like, you know, I have to pack everything up and leave everything here and go back and see what's, what's the deal, you know? And so, um, but when he gets back home on the aisle, um, he realizes it wasn't his Laird who summoned him, but the Laird's daughter, Adara, who, when they were children, they hated each other, you know, as uh, kind of were like little like enemies with one another. And so Jack is like, oh my gosh, like it's Adara, like how dare you bring me back home for like, <laughs> but then he realizes that Adara, um, you know, there's a very sinister problem on the island where these young girls are going missing from the clan and Adara thinks that Jack's music can help her solve this mystery. So as they begin to work together, they realize they might make better partners than mm -hmm. rivals. So <laughs> Um, but of course they begin to kind of unravel the mystery as well. Well, yes. And just mystery and series, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so what was the process of building this world? Like what is the process? I think in some ways is it easier to do world building? What's going on for his characters, plot or world building? So with all of my other books, the character always comes first. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that I'm very much a very character driven type of writer. But with this book, it was very unusual because I saw the island first. So mm -hmm. I envisioned this very misty, moody, magical place. And it looked like the Isle of Skye. So I already kind of had the Scottish inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, this place is very intriguing. Like, who are the people who live here? So from there, I started kind of digging. Um, and I found Torn and Sidra, who were originally going to be more secondary characters. But as I was writing, of course, they kind of took over you know, quite a bit of the story. And I was, it was a very compelling story. They have a marriage of convenience. And um, it's just seeing them work through that. And that was like the very much the adult feel of the story was, it was driven through them. Mm -hmm. um, but then I found Adara and I was like, okay, I feel like I'm still missing one more character. Who is this? And then I found Jack. So it's funny how like my main protagonist was like the last main character. Like I found that the story is very epic and there's multiple points of view. So between Tor and Sidra, Adara and Jack. Um, but Jack is kind of the vocal point because we are with him as he's returning and um, seeing what the aisle, you know, what has happened on the aisle when he's been away. Um, so, yeah, this was a very interesting, the way the story unraveled. It was just, it was, it was different from my other work, but it made me realize that the island was going to play a very, very pivotal role in the story, almost as if it was a character itself. Mm -hmm. I love this. I love when you think about it. The setting, it just makes an impact of how this is going to grow. Like it's going to, the story is going to move forward because of the setting, mm -hmm. you know, that it's not just uh, something just to be where we're living, but it's actually helping you the story tell you what happens next. You know? Yeah. It's very interactive with everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And so what was it like to write multiple point of view? It's like, was it any easier to get into character? Like what's the process for you? So it was surprisingly easy. Um, I have written like dual narratives before, but I had never quite branched out into like four different points of view. And there's even a fifth. There is a, there's one more point of view, um, which I won't say who it is because it might be somewhat of a spoiler. And they don't have that much storytelling as Torrance mm -hmm. Sidra, Jack Madera. But, um, it, you know, it, and I will say this, that originally Adara did not have a point of view. So it was um, really interesting. And one of my feedback was like, hey, Adara feels very like cold and reserved and there is a power imbalance between her and Jack. Like, what do you think about adding her point of view in so readers can really understand who she is and like really get into her head? Because mm -hmm. um, she just felt very walled off. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's actually a really good point because I didn't want readers to feel disconnected from her because mm-hmm. even though she's caring a lot as um, the heiress of the clan, like um, she has a lot of vulnerability and, you know, feelings for Jack are kind of, are shifting and, and how that dynamic's going to be. But um, I found like with Torin and Jack and Sidra, like all three of their voice came like so easily to me. Like I could write from their point of view all day. Um, I added Adara and she was a little bit tricky. Like it took me a while to kind of figure her out and, and how to um, put like where to put her chapters in the story. Cause that's some of the tricky thing with multiple point of view, especially if they're all kind of experiencing the same thing is like, you have to choose who is going to see what. So then you're not constantly recapping when you like shift over to another character um, because that kind of bogs things down. But I felt like it was just amazing how like all these pieces came together for the story. Cause it just, again, it just felt very effortless to have all of their, points of views and how um, they almost balanced or, or contrasted with each other. That's it. So we're searching here. So let's chat about some of your reading. So what kind of books do you attempt to gravitate in terms of reading? Fantasy books. I, <laughs> I love fancy fantasy books so much. I feel like um, as a writer, I have just learned so much about writing by reading. Mm-hmm. Um, so I will always gravitate to, to fantasy. Um, sometimes I do also like picking up historical fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do, um, I want to read more contemporary. Typically I just don't gravitate towards that as much, but mm-hmm. I'm always very open-minded. Um, but I will say recently, I just, it's been kind of hard to find a lot of reading time <laughs> just because of, I have, um, now that I'm doing adult books and YA, like, I feel like I'm constantly going from one deadline to the next. Mm-hmm. But whenever I have a, like a free moment, I always love to read. because I feel like it just kind of refills my well and mm-hmm. it kind of keeps me going. <laughs> I love this. Do you have any books you recommend our listeners to pick up? Yes. So I have three books I want to recommend. And I was trying to think of like almost like a theme of like books mm-hmm. I want to recommend. And so these three books have really amazing plot twists or plot reveals. Um, I always love when a book can catch me by surprise. Sometimes I think when you read a lot, sometimes you see stuff coming. Um, But even if like you can like pick up on a few threads, like you, you predict, I still love it when an author can completely make my jaw hit the floor. Mm -hmm. So these three books, um, like I said, they have amazing plot twists, plot reveals. So the first one um, is N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth Trilogy. Mm -hmm. And it starts with the fifth season This is a very intricate spellbinding story and it has a very unique narrative structure and I cannot give too much away um, because it's almost best to go into this book not knowing too much because that's kind of the magic of it. Um, You're kind of just thrown into this world. It's very like apocalyptic, dangerous. Um, The stakes are really high. And then as you're reading though, um, you start seeing these threads and how they connect. And when the reveal happens, it's just one of the most like incredibly written books I think I've ever read. Like I was just like sobbing and just like, I didn't even know what to do with myself when I finished reading it. Thankfully it is a trilogy. So <laughs> it instantly went out and got the sequel, but um, just an incredible work. And I, I feel like this is categorized more as like a science fiction. Um, mm-hmm. It deals a lot with geology and the rocks and the earth. And so it's very fascinating reads. So I highly recommend that one. Um, the next one I want to recommend is Jellico Road by Melina Marchetta. Now, Melina Marchetta is one of my favorite authors. Um, she wrote, she typically writes contemporary and she's one of those rare authors who can also write fantasy novels. And so one of my favorite trilogies is the Limitera Chronicles written by her. And it is a fantasy series. So if you're looking for, um, another fantasy trilogy that's already out that you can binge, that one is also all three books are out, but Jellico Road is a contemporary novel. Which is again interesting because I don't normally gravitate toward contemporary, but I reread anything Melina writes, even her grocery list. Um, so again, this is one of those stories I can't, I don't want to give too much away about what it's about. It is one of those books you want to go into not knowing too much, but I will say it has one of the most haunting first lines I've ever read. And as you are reading, again, it's one of those books when you when you first get into it, you're really confused and you're trying to figure out what's going on because Melina just kind of drops you right into the story. Um, but then you realize there are two narratives at play. And so once you begin to realize how they intertwine, again, it's like this very just like amazing, heartbreaking, wondrous moment. And it, again, it's just like, gosh, it's just so good. Um, and I, I sat down and read that book in one sitting too. Like I just couldn't put it down. It was just that riveting. So highly recommend Jellico Road by Melina Marchetta. So my third recommendation is The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. 
I love how this book is set in a very glittering, dangerous realm of fairy. And I love how our heroine is this mortal human Jude and how she is determined to make her way in this world, no matter what. And I think the political intrigue that Holly Black weaves together is simply incredible. I love reading political intrigue, but it can be so hard um, to read and also write. So I like, again, really admire her just being able to write it because there are so many pieces, um, so many players that you're trying to flesh out and give them motivations and and not to confuse the reader. Um, So I feel like the political intrigue is wonderful in this book. And of course, when, um, when everything happens, when the plot twist plot reveal happens, like again, my jaw hit the floor. Like I did not see it coming. Um, So this is a very fascinating story. And I love how like all the characters are pretty much morally gray, (laughs) you know, but you still root for them. And, and I still, I love the love story too, the kind of slow burn enemies lovers. So um so yeah those are my three recommendations and they're all complete trilogies which is they are (laughs) yes go you can run out and get them all (laughs) yes it's not like you have to wait and you're like when is the next book coming out (laughs) these are completed (laughs) yes thank you (laughs) tell us where you can find you online so uh you can find me on my website uh www.rebeccarossalpha.com I try to keep it updated. I'm a little bit slow. So sometimes that's not always updated, but um, all my information about my books is up there now. Um, As far as social media, my main platform is Instagram. That is the one I just felt like I couldn't quite (laughs) keep up giving all my time to all these different platforms. I was like, I'm going to just choose one that I enjoy the most and really put channel most of my energy into that one. So it is Instagram. Um, All my news breaks there first. If you're interested in hearing news and Uh, So you can find me at Becca J Ross on Instagram. And then I do have a Twitter account, but it's mainly just for updates and it's underscore Rebecca Ross. And lastly, I want to mention that I do have a Spotify account, um, the same handle as my Instagram, Becca J Ross, where I have a lot of playlists for my books. So if you are a reader who likes to listen to music, either before or during or after you read a book to kind of get the tone, um, you can go find them there. Love this. I love the idea of the Spotify playlist. It makes it <laughs> this like adds a level of, of value to the experience. It's like it's ambience. You're taking it with us. Yes. And they are they are songs that I listened to while I was like writing the book, revising the book. Um, and so if you if you listen from start to finish, it charts like the emotional arc of the story as well. Oh my gosh, I love this. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for being on the show. Yeah, thank you again so much for having me. If you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, rate, and review the show. This is the easiest way to support the podcast. Today's episode's partner is Libra FM. If you're an audiobook listener, then you should add Libra FM as your go-to source for paid audiobooks. Libra FM makes it possible for you to buy audiobooks to your local bookstore. Memberships start at $14.95, and they also have great sales for romance audiobooks each month for $3.99, thanks to the Kiss Club. To sign up for Libro FM, please visit whattoreadnextblog.com slash Libro FM. You will receive a free audiobook when you sign up for a monthly subscription. If you purchase a subscription through our link, you will be supporting the podcast at no cost to you. The What to Read Next podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Please visit frolic.media slash podcast to discover new shows to tune in. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.